Dan said there was actually four police officers. I saw three of them. He said, well, you know she died. And the officer went, yeah, sure. And uh, told the whole story. And all of a sudden, the guy said, you're the one that I've heard about that was dead? And I said, yeah, don't I look dead now? And he said, there's no way that you should be alive. We read the reports. And he said, and I also know that the officer that was part of the resuscitation received an award. He said, it was for you? And I said, yeah. I said, and I've only met him once. I said, they didn't even invite me to my own party. I said, I should have been invited. But I'm just telling you, God is in the business of restoring what we think has died. And that's what I'm going to be sharing with you today. I love sharing stories about my past. I know you probably go, oh, that poor old lady. But my thing is, is that I use stories and I use the word of God because that's how I have been able to accomplish things in my life. The word of God works. And when we have life experiences, then it all of a sudden proves it even more that the word works, that the blood works. You know, I was raised, as I've told you guys, in a very religious home. My parents raised me Southern Baptist. And one day they decided they were going to go against the doctrine. I'm so glad they did. Even though I told them they were bound for hell, I knew that it was good because I could feel the emptiness that was inside of me. We were taught never to look at the book of Acts. We were taught that speaking in tongues was of the devil. But my parents found something called the 700 Club that was on cable. And it changed my dad's life and mom's. And they found a charismatic Baptist church. They knew I wouldn't have stepped in any other denomination. God provided a charismatic Baptist church. And I'll tell you what, it was a transformation. It took time. I had to lose some things to be able for God to fill me with what I should have been filled with in the first place. And I can remember walking into the church. And everybody had their hands raised, and I thought, my goodness, do they all have to go to the bathroom? I mean, I was that ignorant. I had no idea. But after a couple of months of having to adjust to a new way of doing some things, I saw this little girl, and she walked over to her dad, and she said, Daddy, can you pick me up like Jesus picks you up when you worship him? I'll tell you what, it impacted my life. Because I didn't understand why you would raise your hands. I didn't understand that you were saying, Jesus, rescue me. Or you were saying, I adore you and I thank you for what you're doing in my life. And all of a sudden it made sense that when we lift our hands, we're saying, I surrender everything to you. And all of a sudden things started changing in my life. And as I have told you the story, January the 21st, things started changing again, the day that I died in my bedroom. I never thought about that would ever happen to me. You don't think you're going to die, and then you don't think you're going to die and come back. And it wasn't until I was in the ER at Marcus Daly, and I know they've changed the name, but it'll always be Marcus Daly. See, y'all all agree. Y'all just need to change the campaign. <laughs> I know I have two people from Marcus, or excuse me, Bitterroot Health. I stand corrected. But I'm sitting there on the bed. I'm kind of just not conscious yet, and I'm hearing them discuss my condition. And they're saying, did you read the report? She was gone for an hour, six zaps. We know she has broken ribs. We've got the report, 10 minutes without oxygen, maybe more. We don't know if she's going to function. And I'm listening to them thinking, hey, I'm right here. I can hear you. But in the course of finally getting me stabilized, they make the suggestion that they wheel me into another room at Bitterroot Health. That's a hard one to say. And uh, it was a beautiful little room. It was a room with a bed, and there was a TV in it, and there was a, a kind of a chair. And I was kind of glad, not so that I was out of the ER, but I was still in the ER. But Mike was tired. He had broken my ribs. He was a little weary. And um, I just told him, I said, sweetheart, why don't you go ahead and take a nap? If I need something, I can press the button. And the reason I did that it was because I wanted to have some time with Jesus. Again, not only had I been taught about the book of Acts when I was growing up, I had also been taught to be absent in the body means you are 
present with the Lord, and I wasn't. I had no recollection of one hour of my life. And in that ER, I start weeping, and I said, what did I do wrong? I thought you and I were one. Why did you leave me? Why did you forsake me? Why did you not give me what you promised to me in the Word? And I was just sobbing, Mike, out, but I didn't care. I was having a time of of just one-on-one with Jesus. And I heard him as clear as I'm speaking right now. Denise, I didn't leave you. I didn't forsake you. I was with you the whole time. And I carried you from death into life. And I remember feeling what he was saying was so much love. But so often we face situations in our lives that we don't see how we're going to make it through. At that time, all I was hearing that I was going to be unable to care for myself. All I could do was just ask the Father, why didn't you take me when you could have? Maybe you're facing a sickness. Maybe you don't see a way out. Maybe you've had a bad medical report. Maybe you've received the bills that you don't know how you're going to pay because your pocketbook won't let you. Maybe you have a kid that's off course. Maybe you become frustrated and overwhelmed. Maybe you're living worried. And you don't feel like you have the strength to go on. Well, I'm here to tell you, once I got back home, and as you can see, I do sometimes stumble, sometimes I forget, but you know what? I think I did that well before January the 21st. I have been restored because of what Jesus did for us. But I'm also telling you that I spent some time in the Word afterwards. And if you have your Bibles today, I want you to turn to Psalm 68, verse 19. This is a verse that has strengthened me because like I said, so often when I have an experience in my life, I want to see how it lines up in the Word of God. And Psalm 68, 19 tells us what David had experienced. It says simply, each day, say each day. day. Say it again, "Each each day. God carries us in His arms. So often we forget that. So often we're living in situations and we don't think we can get through. But God is telling us in Psalm 68 verse 19, don't worry, be happy, I'm carrying you. And I can promise you he is. And when you're being carried by him, you're going to feel his strength. You're going to feel his love. And the part that I love is that he gives us a peace that passes all understanding. I mean, can you imagine being in ER and the people that are the medical staff is talking over you saying, we don't know if she's going to be able to function or not. And I've even told you the story. I fired one doctor because he said I was going to drool and I would be in a nursing home the rest of my life. That's what I was hearing. But I had a peace that passed understanding. And I'm also telling you there's a favor of God that surrounds each one of us. I call it the fog, the favor of God. And it causes things to fall into place. I look at my life coming up on one year and go, God, you put everything in place. You carried me from death into life. And I know that if you reflect on your life, you're going to see times that you've been carried because Jesus carried you from where you are where you need to be. You know those unfair situations you've had in your life? I'm sure none of you ever have, but I'm sure many of you have. Of those things that caused you to feel like you were dysfunctional or you felt sometimes insecure, I'm here to tell you, look where you are now. You're strong. You're blessed. You are taken care of. And at that moment when that happened, you thought nothing was ever going to work. Like that lady that I just met yesterday. She said, all I want to do is just go home. There's no no room for me here. And it was like, oh, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. And and I told her briefly, I said, so often people think they're done, but they're not even beginning to write the story that God has for them. So don't give up. You're not living by luck. You're living by the grace of God. But even more than that, Jesus is carrying you. He's protecting you, and so often we don't even realize it. I love it that sometimes he moves things out of our ways. 
Sometimes people get moved out of our way. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, yesterday there were several that you want to hug them and you want to kiss them and you want to bless them, but they're lipping off at you and it was like, Jesus, either you take care of it or I do. And it was really amazing because every time I had to say that, it was like they turned around and walked away. And I was like, Jesus, thank you. Because I know he will carry me where I need to be. Also, I'm going to tell you that he opens doors that no man can ever open for you. I'll tell you, I'm not going to tell you the, the name of the business, but I was approached yesterday by a lady who's a big wig in a big organization here in the city. And she said, we want to partner with you with the giveaway next year. You're going to have more than enough money that every person who walks in the door is going to have a new something. I was like, can I have your phone number, please? <laughs> I'm telling you, God's making a way for you. You don't have to beg, borrow, and steal. We have a Jesus who will take care of us. And when we look back over our life, we're going to see that he's carried us, that we've been given strength that we could never imagine. Even when we've lost someone, like when I lost my dad, it was so hard. You know, and I've even told you the story. Not only did I get my mom in the bargain, I also got the fact that I was finally pregnant when I had tried for all those years. You know, that was the blessing that I received, and I didn't even think I would be. But I'm telling you that he will always give us what he desires for us to have. He will carry us to a new place. And I want you to be encouraged that if you can reflect, and I'm going to ask you to put yourself on the line, can any of you reflect when you know you've been carried out of one situation and put into another? It should be every hand. Well, I'm telling you, if he has carried you in the past, he's carrying you right now. What you may be looking at may be insurmountable. What you may be looking at, you may think it's going to defeat you, but I'm telling you, you will not be over, overwhelmed or defeated. Amen. He is there to be for you what you need. Turn to Exodus chapter 19, verse 4. Exodus chapter 19, verse 4 is another scripture that I found after I came back from Bitterroot Health. Are you proud of me? Thank you. Exodus 19, verse 4 said, God brought them out of oppression. God brought them out of bondage by carrying them on eagles' wings. God's bringing you into abundance. He's bringing you into freedom. That's what I saw yesterday. These people need to know who Jesus is. They need to know that he's their rescuer. He will give them freedom. He will give you healing. He will give you joy. He'll give you peace. He'll give you breakthroughs. And the thing that I love so much is when you feel like you're stuck, like that lady told me, she said, I'm just stuck here. I said, no, ma'am, you're not. Because Jesus is lifting you up right now. That scripture says he'll lift you up with eagle's wings. Now, being in the south, we never saw eagles. We saw buzzards. We saw hawks. We saw lots of pigeons. But when I moved here, I saw eagles. And those, those things are gorgeous. They soar so far high that you can't even sometimes see them. And I'm telling you guys, that's what Jesus wants to do for you. He wants you to soar high, taking you from where you are to where you need to be. Let me say it again, Exodus 19.4. God brought them out, brought them out of oppression by carrying them on eagles' wings. He could have said, I'm going to carry you by a goose. But he didn't want to do that. He knew that y'all would know what an eagle would do and how it would take care of us. And I'll tell you what, I love it to know that he is soaring us above all situations. He's taking you out of where you are, promoted, increased, and better off than you've ever been in your life. And like I said, sitting in that ER, I wasn't struggling by myself. He was there with me. And he was taking me from where I was dead in my bedroom into life. A lot of you know, I was only in the hospital 12 hours. 
12 hours. Yeah, I had some IVs. I had some things pumped into my arms. But I'm telling you, when I walked into that room, I was dead. But look what Jesus did for me. And where you are right now, you may be looking at your life and say, there's too many things that are dead. I'm dealing with too much. There's no way that I can ever see the light of the day. You can be like that lady struggling. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus is carrying you right now. About the last time I preached, I shared with you about the Egyptians and the Israelites. What I didn't share was that they were in bondage for 10 generations. That's a long time. And I think it's so amazing that finally God got tired of the fact that his people were being oppressed and he sent a deliverer and his name was Moses. And they were delivered, but you have to realize when you look at the story, and the reason I understand it is that Jesse reminds me of this all the time. Those people knew how to work, but they didn't know how to survive in a wilderness. I can remember telling Jesse one time, this was a couple of years ago, if we ever have a situation where we need to escape, I'm with you, buddy. I'll climb up those mountains. We'll be fine. You don't have to take care of me. Well, he took me fishing, and he realized that was not true. <laughs> Well, these people didn't know how to survive in the wilderness either. But see, God loves to take care of his own. God loves to take care of his kids. Well, these people, they didn't know how to survive. He sent them manna every morning. Then when they complained, which I'm sure you have never done in your life to God, God switches the winds and he brings quail into their camp. So now they have manna and quail. But they didn't have a whole lot of water either, so what did he have Moses do? Go strike the rock, I'll give you water. He takes care of us even when we don't know how to take care of ourselves. Now the part that I've had a little chit-chat with Jesus on is they also had shoes that never wore out. No thank you, God. i got to have new shoes at least twice, three times a week. Their clothes never wore out. Come on, God, I need a new style at least once a month. But see, God knew what they had need of. And he made certain that they were taken care of. But when you look at it, you go, how did they survive? I know I couldn't. I would barely be able to get a walk across the street, let alone 40 years in the wilderness. But I love how God explains it. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 31. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 31 tells us how they got to their promised land. It says, in the wilderness, there you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his son all the way until you reach that place. Did you get that? He's carrying you to your promise. He's carrying you to whatever place that you have need of. And I'm sure they're just like you and me. God, why am I still here? Why am I dealing with sickness? Why am I dealing with debt? Why am I dealing with Denise and Mike and Jesse and Michelle? God, I thought I would be delivered from that by now. How come I'm not to my promise yet? How come I'm not where I need to be? Well, they didn't realize that God was sustaining them. They didn't realize that God was carrying them to their promise. And I'm telling you, you're being carried to your promise. If your body needs healing, he's carrying you to that place. But I also need to tell you, you're going to have detours along the way. You're going to have people that are going to tell you you don't know what you're talking about. It'd be better if you were just dead. But I'm telling you that's not how God looks at us. Our job is to stay in peace. Now who is our Prince of Peace? What is his name? That's where we're staying is in his arms. That's where you and I need to stay. He did it for the Israelites. He's doing it for you, and he's carrying you into your promise, which are all yes and amen. I'm going to read Deuteronomy 131 to you again. It transformed me years ago when I briefly looked at it, but all of a sudden in this last year it's become even more alive. 
in the wilderness, in your sickness, in what you think is lack, in a family situation, you saw how the Lord your God carried you. As a father carries his son all the way until you reach the place. Now, again, I'm getting a little bit older. I'm not going to tell you how much because I, I don't want you to go, boy, you look bad. Um, I'm getting a little older, but in my 60s now, it's good to know that he still loves to carry me. I'm not too old to be in my father's arms. I'm not too big for him to not pick me up and be with me. I'm telling you, no matter what you're looking at today, I'm telling you that he will pick you up and he will carry you to where you need to go. As a matter of fact, right now, you're in your Savior's arms. Right now, he is moving things around for you. And it reminds me so much, you know, I see Sarah going and taking care of the baby. If I went and tried to rip that baby from her arms, she'd rip me apart. Because that's what a mama does. That's a heart of a parent. And I'm telling you, that's what Father God is doing for you today. He's not going to let the devil rip you out of his arms. As a matter of fact, turn to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11. It's a lot of scriptures today, but I think you're going to guess that it's all about him carrying you. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 11 says, He carries you close to His heart. He knows what you're dealing with. And I love it because He knows how to get the answer where you need to get it. But I also know Pastor Nancy last week, she said, I want each of you to know that you are His prized possession. I want you to know that there's nothing more valuable to Him than you. And when she said that, I was like, oh my goodness, I need to use that next week because we are valuable. We are his masterpieces. And he's carrying you close to his heart. He doesn't want you to not feel loved, protected, and cared for. He wants you to know that he's willing to go the extra mile. He's willing to go to the cross for you. I'm going to tell you another story, but this is from 2 Samuel chapter 9, if you want to pull it up. 2 Samuel chapter 9, we're going to learn about this young man called Mephibosheth. That's a fun name to say. And for a southern tongue, I slaughter it. But Mephibosheth, he was the son of Jonathan, who was King David's favorite best friend. And Mephibosheth was also the grandson of King Saul. Now this young man was born into royalty. This young man was destined to take the throne because both his grandfather and his father were in that position. But unfortunately, one day, on the same day, both of those men were killed in a battle. So again, the word gets back to the palace that both of them were dead and that some people were getting ready to storm the palace and to kill everyone that was associated with that kingdom. So the maid heard those words. She picked up Mephibosheth and with all good intentions decided to escape. But as she was running down the stairs, she tripped and she fell. But worse than that, Mephibosheth fell out of her arms, he broke his legs, and he became a cripple. Sad, sad story, right? You think it's done. But unfortunately, we see in 2 Samuel chapter in verse 9, starting in verse 1, that they fast forward a little bit so you know that not only was Mephibosheth taken out of the palace, he was now living in a place called Lodabar. And Lodabar actually was the poorest and the most rundown city of the kingdom. But when you look at the fact that Mephibosheth was destined to be a king, and now he's living in Psalms, I mean, that was not only not his fault, he was dropped. And I'm going to stop right here, and I'm going to tell you, how many times have we been dropped by people, by situations, where our hearts are broken, where our bodies have become so deformed because of the hurt. And that's where Meshibbeth was. 
I mean, he literally thought he had missed his destiny. But see, God never forgets us. Say, God never forgets me. Never forgets me. Say it again. So one day, David, who's now the king of the land, is sitting at his dining table. And we see this in chapter 9, verse 1. King David asked his assistants, are there any of Jonathan's relatives still alive so that I can be good to them? That's a strange question. Years have passed. Why all of a sudden now? It's because God was making a way where there was no way. And the assistants that were at the table said, well, we heard something about Bathibosheth. He's living in the slums of Lodabar, but he's crippled. And I love it because you see that God's got a plan for each one of us. So he sends his messengers to go get him, to bring Mephibosheth to the palace. Well, Mephibosheth must have lived in a small town like Hamilton. He got word that the king was looking for him. And his first thought was, King Saul, my grandfather, tried to king, kill King David. So there is the greatest of possibilities going to try to kill me. Well, the assistants came in, and the chef couldn't walk. They said, we're going to carry you to the palace. So those assistants, I mean, I saw you guys picking up furniture yesterday. Here they were picking this guy up, taking him out of the slums, bringing him to the palace, not knowing what the end result would be. But this guy, because he was crippled, could only go if he was carried. And this was not like from here to the church across the street. This was miles and miles they had to move him. Well, I, I just see this story so well in my face because how many of us would have said, please don't take me. I'm fine. I'll stay right here in my filth. I don't need to see a change. I'm okay. I've lived this way my whole life. You don't need to worry about it. But see, Mephibosheth thought that he was getting what was due to him. He was going to die. Now let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 7. David, he says to Mephibosheth, don't be afraid. David said, I intend to show you kindness because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, King Saul, and you will eat here at the table with me, the king. Mephibosheth couldn't believe what he was hearing. He thought he was never, ever going to go back to the palace again. And all of a sudden, the king of the land is telling him, you're going to live in the palace. You're going to have all the land that your grandfather had. And not only that, you're going to sit at my table every night. Again, I want you to know that's what the king of this created world that we've been living in wants to do for you. He wants to invite you into the palace. He wants you to invite into his presence. He wants to want you to know that he's giving you everything that should be yours because of the price that Jesus paid for you. Now, Mephibosheth thought he had had too many bad breaks. He figured that he had missed his destiny. And again, I come up and I say, I know I have felt that way as myself, that, you know, I, I lived in Pritchard, a city that declared bankruptcy for six times. I lived in places where I probably never should have been, but God in the midst of that still brought me to his presence. And here, Mephibosheth, God's showing us that he desires to carry us into his presence. God's showing us with this beautiful, beautiful thing in 2 Samuel verse 9, that even when life throws us curves, even when life is unfair, even when people have dropped us and hurt us and crushed our hearts, even when we thought ourselves that we could never, ever go beyond where we are, I'm telling you, God is carrying you to where he's always planned. He's carrying you into your destiny. And Jesus loves to carry you no matter what setbacks you have. No matter what's gone on, he will give you eagle's wings to soar above what you're dealing with. And like I said, he loves having you next to his heart. He wants to carry you out of Lodabar. 
He wants to carry you out of whatever you're dealing with because he doesn't want you to feel left out or forgotten. That's how much he loves you. Maybe you've gotten a medical bill. I remember how I felt after the, the incident. I mean, it's amazing. I'm in the hospital 12 hours, and I told Mike, I said, I've not spent this much money in my whole life. But the hospital says, I've got to pay it. Mike, what are we going to do? I hate it when your husband's right. And he says, honey, don't worry about it. God said he's going to take care of it. And I'm letting you know, he took care of it. I mean, I just stand amazed. I didn't even have to pay my deductible. God took care of that one as well. So I'm telling you, if you've got a medical report and it's not good, he's going to take care of you. He's going to take you from death into life. Maybe you have some bills. If you listen to the news very long, they'll tell you that more people have higher bills than they've ever had before. I'm telling you, God's carried you to the palace and the promise. That's his word. And just like we see the story of Mephibosheth being carried into the palace, you're being carried into your promise. You're being carried into abundance. You're being carried into health and victory. That's the promise that Jesus has made for us. So nothing can stop you from being brought to the throne room of the king. Nothing. Because that's what Jesus did on the cross for you. He's carrying you into his presence. So today, I want you to look at your heart and realize you're being carried. He's taking you from where you are to where you need to be. He's taking you from death into life. He's taking you from lack to abundance. He's taking you from joy, and he's giving you even more joy. He doesn't want you to just have a little bit. He wants you to have more than enough. I know yesterday I saw so many people hurting. And it was funny because, like I said, someone gave us some money just to hand out. And I told God, I said, you tell me who needs it. And I will give it to him greatly. And there was this one guy who was wearing this green heavy jacket. I even told Mike, I said, it looked like he was part of a, a mafia team. But when I went by him, I turned around and he had paint that had accidentally been splattered on his coat in the back. And God said, that one. And I went over to him. I said, sir, I'm so sorry to bother you. I said, but I just want to give you something. He said, what do you want to give me? And that's the way he talked to me. And I turned around and I went, okay, God, this is the one. And I handed him, I said, put out your hand. And I put some money in his, his hand. And he looked down at it. He said, what's this for? I said, we just want to let you know that Jesus loves you and he knows where you are. And I said, whatever you have need of, you just ask him. I said, I'm just giving you a little bit of a blessing. And he went to turn away from me and he came back and he said, would you forgive me? He said, I've never had anybody love me before. And I said, well, come here, baby. <laughs> and I gave that guy the biggest hug, and he was crying, I was crying. And it reminded me once again that Jesus loves it when we have become crippled, no fault of our own, and that he will move us from the slums to the palace. He will move us from not having enough into having more than enough. He will carry you to the promise. So today, I don't know where you are. I don't know what you're dealing with. But I do know that we have a Savior that loves to carry us. Yes. I'm so grateful. And I am living proof that he will carry you and put you in a new place that's very secure with him. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want you to be honest with yourself and reflect on the times that you know you've been carried, whether it because you lost someone, whether because you received a bad doctor's report, whether it be that you have looked at life and you just go, I don't see how this is going to work. And you're saying, today I want to be lifted up by his eagle's wings and his arms. I just want you to be honest. We're going to pray for you right where you are. I want to soar with him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
hands have gone up all over this place, and I'm raising my hands too because so often we think that we've caused our life and that we just have to live with it. But just like Mephibosheth, we're being carried into the presence of the king. So, Father, I thank you that you love us so much. That even, Father, when we are being oppressed, that you, Father, are carrying us to the place where we need to be. Father, I thank you that this group is healed in Jesus' name because you're carrying them into that place. I thank you, Father, for more than enough because, Jesus, you yourself are more than enough for us. Thank you for bills paid off that they do not even know how it happened, but they know it was because of you. Father, I thank you for family situations that they're dealing with. That, God, that the people that they're dealing with have become calm, they've become peaceful, and, Father, they are actually being able to see the love that they have for these people. Father, I thank you that you carry us close to your heart today. That's all we want. We want you. We don't want anything else. And we thank you, Father, that Jesus, you are our protector. You are our provider. You are our deliverer. You are our healer. And you are our way maker. And we give you the glory in the precious name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.